Hi, my name is Doug Judd. I'm the CEO of Hypertable Incorporated. We're the company that develops Hypertable, and we also provide professional services around the technology, including uh, support, training, and certification. Today, I'm going to present Hypertable, the storage infrastructure behind Redif Mail, one of the world's largest email services. The talk is broken into two parts. <laughs> In the first part, I present a hypertable overview to provide some background and context, which will help understand the read of mail application. I'm going to focus on uh, the database model, how data is represented in hypertable, as well as some of the features that the read of mail application uses. And then in the second part of the talk is the, the case study. Okay, so what is Hypertable? Hypertable is a high-performance, open-source, scalable database modeled after Google's big proprietary Bigtable database. Uh, one of the goals from the very inception of the project was to achieve optimum performance. And to that end, we chose to do the implementation in C++. Now, even though the system itself is implemented in C++, uh, we provide a thrift interface, which uh, provides language bindings for all popular high-level languages, including the ones that you see here. Uh, the project was started in early 2007. So what is Bigtable? Bigtable is uh, one of Google's proprietary uh, scalable databases. Um, as of a couple years ago, over 100 services at Google uh, were built on top of Bigtable, including the ones you see here. Um, and one thing to, to note is that it's a proven design. It's been proven out by arguably the largest uh, uh, web company on earth to work well in a, a wide variety of, of use cases. So how does Hypertable differ from a relational database? So first and foremost, it's, it was designed from the ground up to be horizontally scalable. It's designed to tie a large number of commodity machines together to act as one large uh, database. Um, another, another place where it differs from a relational database is it's a sparse table structure. So you can literally have one row in the table that has a billion columns in the next row that just has two or three. Um, in addition, if you think of a table as kind of like an Excel spreadsheet, um, each cell in, in a table, in hypertable, can have multiple time-stamped revisions. And then finally, it's part of this uh, NoSQL category of database. Um, we currently don't support joins or transactions. So here's just a, a sampling of some of the hypertable deployments. Okay, so database model. Um, data in hypertable is represented as two-dimensional tables of information. Uh, where each uh, cell can have multiple time-stamped revisions. Um, each cell in the table is identified by a four-part key. There's the, the row key, the column family, a column qualifier, and a timestamp. And the timestamp is what gives you the multiple time-stamped revisions. So here's a, a diagram of what a table in Hypertable looks like. This was taken from the Big Table paper um, where they describe their uh, crawl database. And they store, um, uh, for every page that they crawl, they, they, they represent that as a single row in this table. And the row key is the URL for the page with the domain name reversed so that all URLs for this same domain sort next to each other in the table. Um, as you can see here, there's three column families. We've got a title, a content, and anchor. Um, so the anchor column illustrates the use of the column qualifiers. 
So with the, in a search engine, they don't just index the text that's on the page, but they also index the remote anchor text from links that point to that page. That's why you might have a, a page that's just an image of a Ferrari with no text on it, but you type in Ferrari and it, and it pops up in the results set. And the way they do that is um, they created this uh, anchor column family, and there's a qualified instance of that column family for every remote link that points to this page. So this is how they collect all the text associated with this document. Now that multidimensional table structure under the hood just flattens out into a flat list of key value pairs where the key is the uh, row key, the column family, the column qualifier, and the timestamp, and the value is just the content of the cell. So here, here's a, a more detailed look at, at the key, or our key. Um, it's, it starts out with a single control byte, followed by the null terminated row key, followed by a single byte, which represents the column family. So in Hypertable, there's a limit of 256 column families. And then followed by that is a null terminated column qualifier. And then uh, there's a flag here that indicates what kind of record it is. Uh, so in Hypertable and Bigtable, when you delete information, it doesn't immediately get deleted. What happens is there's a delete record that gets inserted into the database that gets applied at query time and uh, in these background processes uh, called compactions. Um, and then following that is a timestamp, and then we also have this revision number. Okay, so here's, uh, now I'm gonna move into some of the features uh, that uh, Hypertable has that Re Read If Mail uses. Um, the first is regu regular expression filtering. We use Google's RE2 regular expression engine, which is extremely fast, and it uh, runs it with a fixed amount of memory. So somebody can't enter some monster query that brings down the system. Um, and the supported uh, searches are for the row key. We can do a regex match on the row key, the column qualifier, and, and the value. And this is an example select statement that does all three. OK, so in Hypertable, there's uh, several layers of caching. Um, there's a block cache, so all data that goes into the system gets compressed and written out into these uh, cell store files, which are equivalent to the SS table uh, files in the big table paper. And they're essentially compressed blocks of key value pairs, and so the system has a block cache to cache those in memory. Uh, it also has a query cache, which caches the result for single row queries. So, so range queries, it doesn't cache, um, just if you're searching for a specific row. Okay, and then um, the, the column families, uh, when you create your schema, you list out the column families and they accept a number of options. And um, here are a couple of the column family options that are available. One is TTL and that tells the system only keep data in this column uh, for, for this period of time. So any data that's older than that period of time will get automatically deleted and garbage collected. And then you can also tell it only keep the N most recent versions of this particular column. Okay, so now I'm going to move into the read of mail case study. Um, so one disclaimer, uh, Rediff has asked me not to reveal any aggregate numbers. So all the, the stats that I include here are, are relative. Um, so so Rediff.com is uh, one of India's largest web portals. 
the company was founded in 1996, and they launched their flag flagship uh, email product, uh, Rediff Mail, in 1998. And uh, the, the service has been growing steadily ever since. Um, and then about the middle of 2011, they started seeing sluggish response times and frequent outages. And so they, um, you know, after some analysis, they discovered that the, the problem was that the, the re request load on the underlying storage system was, was too heavy. And um, as, as it turns out, that over 75% of the storage system requests uh, were for, for metadata. And that's uh, things like managing the, the inbox and, um, yeah, things like that. So at the end of the last year, they decided to uh, re-architect the system. Excuse me. They decided to re-architect the system by shifting all of the, the metadata into Hypertable. And, um, and so that, that's the system I'm going to describe here. So this is a screenshot of the Rediff Mail uh, web client. It just looks like your typical web email client. Um, you can you know, move messages around, delete messages, mark things as, as spam. And this is the, the 10,000 foot overview of what the system looks like. Now, so the way it works is they've, they've sharded the, the system into to multiple shards, and they, they, run, um, they run each shard in a separate data center. And this is the architectural overview of what uh, the system looks like in a single data center. This big cloud here is uh, the front end web servers, and they are connected directly to the storage appliance cluster. And the storage appliance cluster is used to hold the, the mail bodies. And then it's connected to two hypertable clusters, which are used to store um, the metadata. And each cluster stores a complete copy of the metadata, and they're, they're exact replicas of one another. And um, uh, read requests typically go to the primary cluster, and then if, if they're doing maintenance on the primary cluster, it'll fail over to the secondary cluster. Or if they need more capacity, they will uh, send requests to both clusters. Okay, so how it works. Um, so, it, so an email is, uh, consists of, of two parts. There's the, the header information, and this is things like the sender, the subject, uh, mail attachment information, things like that, and then the body. And these two, um, these two things are, are static, they never change. Um, so the mail headers are stored in Hypertable, and the mail bodies are stored in the storage appliance cluster. And then they uh, have user actions. So whenever somebody does something with an email, you know, they, whether they read it or move it from one mailbox to another or um, mark it as spam, uh, they'll store that information in Hypertable as well. And this is a simplified version of the schema that they use. Um, there's really two uh, essential columns here mail headers that con contains the mail headers, and it's set with the max versions equal to one. And mail actions, which is um, the set of actions that have been done on the, the, the mail. OK, so um, this is the uh, mail header format or of the, yeah. So the row key is the mailbox ID, and this is essentially the uh, email address uh, of the inbox. The column qualifier is the message ID, and so this is the identifier that uniquely identifies the message. The value is all the header information, and the timestamp is the mail creation timestamp. And this is an example of what 
one actually looks like. Okay, so the mail actions column, it, it's formatted in a similar way. The, the row key is the mailbox ID or the email address of the, the inbox. The column qualifier is the message ID and the, the value is information about the actions. Oh, and embedded in the value in, in both of these uh, columns is a pointer to the mail uh, body in the storage appliance cluster. And the timestamp is the mail action timestamp. Okay, so, so updates are um, written to both the primary and secondary, and if, if either of the clusters is offline, the system will, will buffer the updates to local disk and push them through once the cluster gets back online. So here's um, a graph taken from our monitoring system for a one week period. And um, this is for updates. And as you can see, this diurnal pattern where it peaks out in the middle of the day and then at, in the middle of the night, it, it has a trough there. Um, this is uh, another graph that's illustrated. And this is for one machine. Um, illustrates the number of table bytes written. So this is a number of updates per second, which is somewhere around 40, but each update consists of about 10 um, cells. And um, that, that's how much data gets written on one machine per second. Okay, so now queries. Uh, there are several different queries that get issued against the hypertable cluster. The first is for the mail listing. This is when you first log in and, and the system renders the, the mailbox um, or if you page down. The second is mail search. They provide the ability to search through the header, header information and the way they implement that is using the regex queries against the, the value. And the third is mail sync. So if you're synchronizing a, a, your handheld device or your IMAP or POP, um, it issues queries against the hypertable cluster. And so here's a graph that shows the scans per second. And um, as you can see, similar diurnal pattern. And this is uh, table bytes read per second. And um, it's similar, as, although you can see these, there's a couple of big spikes there. And that's when they kicked off a, a big select star that uh, ended up, they did it in the middle of the night that scanned the entire table for some stats uh, job. Okay, and so this uh, shows the block cache hit rate. As you can see, the, almost the entire data set fits in memory. And here's the query cache hit rate, which is uh, pretty good. It's up over 50%. Okay, and um, this is a latency graph that shows average latencies for a one, one day period. Um, as you can see, it's pretty good. Um, during the day, it, it bumps up a little bit. And then here's, um, here's the output of a tool called DSTAT. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's a very useful tool. It aggregates uh, IO stat and VM stat and top, just all the important system statistics. Um, so this is a DSTAT output um, while the system, during off-peak load. And um, it's divided into five sections. You have CPU statistics disk read-write, network read-write, paging statistics, and then the system column here on the right shows interrupts per second and context switches per second. And as you can see, during off-peak load, it's pretty, pretty idle. 
And then this is um, the DSTAT output for, for peak load. Um, as you can see, there's, there's more CPU time. Although the disk and the network, you know, the numbers have increased, but they're still um, way below capacity. Um, but what's interesting over here is the number of interrupts and context switches has shot up dramatically. Okay, so, so that was the existing system. They're currently in the process of re-architecting the system. Um, and it's going to look like this. Essentially, they'll keep all the, the message bodies in the storage appliance cluster. And um, they'll also have a, a, a hypertable cluster that con contains all of the, the metadata. And then they're, they're going to introduce this 30-day uh, cache, which is a, in hypertable. And it's going to hold the metadata and the message bodies for the mail over the past 30 days, uh, because the bulk of the requests hit the last 30 days where the mail. All right, so that's it. Any questions? Thank you. Um, why should I use Hypertable instead of HBase? Well, um, so, so the main difference between Hypertable and HBase is Hypertable is implemented in C++, HBase is uh, implemented in Java, and the nature of a database, or the profile of a database is such that it, it's very memory um, intensive, uses a lot of memory, and under certain workloads, it can generate lots of garbage. And so, uh, ultimately, we believe that you can get much more capacity on a fixed set of hardware um, with a C++ implementation than you can with a Java implementation. No, I don't know the impl implementation of HBase, but when they, mm, when they use um, the new buffers from Java, um, new the input format from Java? Oh, uh, okay, it's, it's too special, I think. And I.O., the new, um, yeah, new I.O. It's um, nearly as fast as C++. Well, the, the new I.O.? Yep. Well, for, for I.O., yeah, I mean, the C++ doesn't give you an advantage. It's, um, it's memory, essentially malloc calls and CPU as well. So, but for I.O., there's, you, like Hypertable, we typically run on top of HDFS, and, which is fine because the bulk of what HDFS does is I.O. It moves data to and from disk and over the network. So there's, there's not a huge advantage of implementing the file system in C++. It's really the database application. Um, why didn't you move all the uh, bodies to, to H, uh, uh, Hypertable? What was the problem there? I think all the bodies from websites were in Bigtable at Google, so uh, why do you just cache and do this this way? You know, I think it's, it, it's an incremental thing. Um, they already had a system that worked for that, and um, um, I think it was less of a radical change. Um, because the amount of the amount of data represented by the headers is real, or the metadata is relatively small in comparison. So um, I think that, that that's their first step, and and that last slide that I showed you is kind of their next step. And I think ultimately they they want to shift everything. All right, thank you very much.